Welcome, everyone, once again to Writers and Fighters, a podcast. I'm your host, AJ Ortega. And each and every week, I interview someone who writes or someone who fights. Today is episode 26, and I'll be interviewing Colby Applegate, a writer and editor. We talk about his education and his interest in writing, working for WWE's NXT brand, his overall interest in pop culture, and his latest project. Just a few months ago, he released Ring Post Journal No. 1, a 2020 Women's Wrestling Year in Review. And so it's a really cool conversation and good to hear about that project that Journal put together. So stay tuned for that interview. But before I get to that interview, I just want to reflect or react to some fight stuff. A week or two ago, Clarissa Shields, a super decorated pro boxer, had her MMA debut for PFL, Professional Fighters League, and a lot of people picked her to lose. As we've seen when a fighter moves from one discipline to another, people want to chalk that up to not being able to transition into another combat sport. And I get that because we... I mean, history tells us so. However, I figured she would have a good shot because of her approach to transitioning from boxing to MMA. First of all, she trained at Jackson Winkle John, which is where people like John Jones and Holly Holm train. And Holly Holm was a champion boxer herself, and she transitioned quite well into MMA. And so Shields is taking a similar approach and starting in PFL, Professional Fighters League. And this is really smart to be in a larger MMA promotion rather than a regional one, but also not shooting for UFC or one championship or Bellator, where I think the competition would be too much for her, right? Holly Holm did not start in the UFC, right? She had a career before that and and worked her way into the biggest promotion in MMA. Uh, So Shields is kind of doing a version of that, I think. You know, she's a super decorated boxer in several divisions, and... Despite that, she wasn't perfect. She wasn't perfect uh, in her match, Um, but it was still impressive against uh, Brittany Elkin. She showed a lot of skills in MMA that are going to serve her well. Like, she was controlled a lot by Elkin on the ground in the first two rounds for pretty much most of the first two rounds, but she did have pretty decent defense when she was on the ground. She didn't take a lot of damage despite being on the bottom, which is good, But she wasn't able to get to her feet as easily as I think she thought she would have. I think she maybe underestimated how hard it is to work your way to that fence and and get back to your feet when somebody's on top of you. But then in the third, she stuffed a takedown attempt from Elkin with a really good sprawl that I think impressed everybody. That was like really good defense for jujitsu or wrestling. And eventually she was able to get in almost a dominant position on the ground. It's kind of an awkward position, but uh, she ends up winning via ground and pound. I think it was a good stoppage by the referee. Brittany Elkin ate too many shots, and you know, for her safety, they called it. And so the interesting thing here is that Clarissa Shields is going to try to compete in both boxing and MMA rather than moving completely away from boxing. And I think that's maybe doable. Um, I don't know who else she fights in in boxing. I think there's a few matchups there for her, but I think it's a good move if she keeps fighting the appropriate fighters in mixed martial arts. She's at the top of boxing, so she has to fight the top of the boxing world. But in MMA, I think if they keep her in PFL for a little bit and fights, you know, people with like Elkin's record, uh, Brittany Elkin, her record was three and six in MMA, I think at the time. And I think that's fair. It's a losing record, um, but she's a pro. I mean, that's that's a lot of fights. But I think, you know, somebody with maybe four pro fights or less would be even better because, you know, at this point, Clarissa Shields only has one. I mean, I think, you know, whether you, you win or lose, that's only, it's still only one. It's still no experience. And so I don't think they should need to give her undefeated fighters and things like this. I think maybe get somebody that's one in three or two in two, And not that she should get easy fights. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying the appropriate fights where the skill set is similar, where the experience and time of the sport is similar or as close as we can get. And that's how these matchups happen normally. Like when they're 
isn't a fighter from another sport jumping in. You know, if you're two and zero, they don't put you in there with somebody that's fifteen and zero. Like that just doesn't happen. You know, and so or vice versa. If you're, you know, on a streak and you, you're you're a five and zero, six and zero MMA fighter, you know they're not going to give you somebody that's one and four or one and five with a ridiculous losing record. And so the appropriate matchups have to happen. So I don't think they should put anybody in front of her that has more than four or five pro fights because the boxing experience doesn't entirely matter here. I mean, it gives her a bit of a platform and things like this. She lands in the right promotion, PFL. But I think the matchups need to be really calculated. And it sounds like the, she has good management or, and PFL is doing the right thing because they didn't feed her to uh, one of the sharks like uh, Kayla Harrison, for example. So this was an interesting exception to this rule that we think that there is in combat sports. The rule being that you cannot succeed if you transition into another combat sport that is not your own. Yeah, this is, again, an exception, or maybe there's going to be a handful of them. Similarly, MMA legend Anderson Silva had a boxing match against Julio Cesar Chavez Jr., the boxer, former middleweight champion, in a real match, a competition, not an exhibition, right? There's a difference between competition and exhibition. And in some media outlets, this was being promoted as Silva's boxing debut, his pro boxing debut, but that's just not true. This was his third pro boxing match. He's one and one in boxing prior to this fight, and they were both in Brazil. One of them, the most recent one, I think, was over 10 years ago, and then the one before that was maybe another 10, something like that. Um, But in any case, Silva looked great, and I had him winning decisively maybe, and maybe giving two out of the eight rounds to Chavez. So I had... Silva winning six, seven rounds of eight. And Silva had a good boxing stance, great head movement, great defensive stance as well. And at a certain point, he was even showboating a bit, uh, you know, daring Chavez to go toe-to-toe with him on the ropes type of stuff. Halfway through the fight, Chavez Jr. is winded. He doesn't look sharp at all. I mean, he was never really that good to begin with. But his head movement was completely gone by round four. Get to like round six and he's gassed and looking a little bit battered. Silva is seemingly taking no damage, really. Chavez is landing some shots, but nothing that puts Silva in trouble. And they're usually met with counter punches anyway. And that's a technique that Silva kept from MMA. He's always been a counter puncher. After the eighth and final round, they go to the judges, and it was a split decision for Silva. And I suppose we can chalk up the one judge favoring Chavez Jr. to the fact that it was an event for his father, and they were in Mexico and stuff like that. Um, Chavez looks beat up at the end of, you know, when they are announcing the winner and everything. Chavez looks beat up, but Silva looks like he's ready for a photo shoot and like he could run a marathon. So, in Clarissa Shields, we have a boxer that successfully had a real MMA match. Then in Silva, we have an MMA fighter that successfully had a real boxing match. And this is the way to do it, with real competition, I think, rather than through goofy exhibitions and shows that are designed for publicity mostly, rather than athletic competition. And so I wish these fights... The Shields fight uh, from a couple weeks ago and the Anderson Silva and Chavez fight, I wish both of these would have been promoted a little bit better. And that way people can see that the cross-pollination of combat sports can be a positive thing for both fans and fighters alike. All right, enough fight talk. Let's get to that interview with Colby Applegate, freelance writer and the editor of Ring Post Journal. Enjoy. And I'm sitting here now with Colby Applegate. Colby, tell the audience a little bit about who you are and maybe why are you on this weird podcast? Hello, everyone. My name is Colby Applegate. Um, I am a writer and editor. And I am on this particular podcast because I self-published a what I'm calling a wrestling journal um, earlier in the spring. And I'm trying to get the word out since it's my first major project, I guess. 
No, yeah, that's one of the, the big things I want to talk about, and we'll definitely get there in a moment. But when did you get into writing? So you're a writer and editor. When did you first get into writing? So I initially, as a child, was more interested in math and science, I guess. I wanted to be a weatherman when I was super, super young. And then by the time I hit middle school, started realizing what I liked and didn't like, numbers weren't my thing. So I found myself <laughs> oh, you too? gravitating towards, yeah, towards uh, words. I actually enjoyed writing like essays and stuff in our English classes. So that's when I started having an inkling of, okay, well, maybe writing is the path, even though I didn't know exactly what I wanted to write. And then I kind of had like this major opportunity as little old eighth grader. Our high school basketball team went to the state championship and the newspaper needed someone to go cover the story. And so they sent me and I got to sit courtside with all the hotshot journalists, me wearing a little sweatshirt, sweatpants. I have a clipboard and <laughs> line paper taking notes like I know what I'm doing. So that was kind of the first inkling of, oh, okay, well, maybe I'll do this for the rest of my life. That's interesting. So you got into the uh, the writing game because of a, a sports writing gig. Yeah. And then from there on, did you go on to study writing in college? Did you get a degree in writing? Or is that something you, you took other avenues for or both? So I knew pretty early on in high school, I was dead set on writing. And then I discovered Full Sail through WWE when NHC started going there. And I guess one day I just went to their website and looked at what programs they had, found creative writing, looked it up, started looking into different things. And I knew because of Full Sail's relationship with WWE that that'd be a good spot to go if I wanted to work for WWE or write for WWE. So I toured the school twice. And then before my senior year even started, I was, I guess you could say, enrolled at Full Sail. Right. Um, to start after my senior year ended. There you go. And so when you went to Full Sail University, what degree were you seeking there? Was it a production degree or was it a, a writing degree? So it was a creative writing Bachelor of Fine Arts. And with Full Sail, they don't have a traditional bachelor's program for like four years. They condensed everything into 20 months or you can take have the option of going a more extended route, which is like, believe 30 or 32 months so I went uh, moved down to Florida Orlando right out of high school and got my bachelor's degree just short of two years after I graduated high school sweet man wow that's quick yeah for a BFA that's really cool because typically you know a BA takes you know four years and BFA sometimes those take about five and so you got that done in about under two yeah, it it was intense. <laughs> <laughs> I bet, man. Jeez, I bet you didn't get a chance to breathe. Shit. Right. And so after that, what did you do in terms of, did you gig for a bit? Or were you able to figure out those connections you were seeking there in terms of the uh, WWE and whatnot? So early on in at Full Sail, I got to start volunteering with um, NXT, working kind of the production side. And then with one group and then with another group, I was working more of the live events marketing side. And so I did that while I was a student. That kept me really busy, made connections, networked, all these good things. And then not even, I was still a year, no, I was less than a year out from graduating. But it was a year after I had started at Full Sail, I got offered a position with NXT um, as a marketing coordinator. It was basically an internship. But I got to, you know, be on payroll and go around all the live events in Florida, oversee a group of student volunteers and be around the talent. So every weekend I was I was at the NXT shows and even though my degree was in writing, I, you know, kind of picked up an interest in marketing by doing that. And I ended up doing that for a year after I graduated, all the way up until April twenty twenty. Not exactly because of COVID, my contract was ending anyway, but COVID put an end to <laughs> no, the end sure. of my time there. No, that's cool though. But yeah, that you got this degree in writing and you end up in a marketing position 
And I think that's kind of natural in a lot of ways because, again, I'm an English professor, so I, I always tell my students that, like, yeah, I'm teaching you English and even the creative writing classes, composition classes, technical writing, business writing, these kinds of things. I'm like, it's all communication. And if you can communicate effectively, like, it's a very versatile, very flexible degree, you know. And so if you're good with words, you can talk your way into a lot of jobs, you know. And yeah. so um, and so that's really cool that you end up in a, in a marketing position and end up uh, uh, expanding that portfolio, that resume and whatnot. Yeah. And so what kind of writing do you do? I did a quick Google of you and you uh, – <laughs> You write about pop culture, like television and film. Okay, so so you got this wrestling interest that we'll get to uh, deeper in a moment. But you do pop culture stuff in general. Yeah. Um, So 2019, I graduated Full Sail April 2019. So I spent like the rest of that year um, trying to figure out what I wanted to do because I I basically fulfilled my my time with WWE. Um, and while I was very grateful to keep working there, I also needed, I was job hunting and looking for, you know, what I wanted to do next. And I, I didn't even, I didn't really know what I wanted to do after I graduated, um, because I walked into full sale with the idea that I wanted to go into television writing, um, because I really like watching dramas and I just thought that'd be something really cool to do is, you know, write those TV shows that I enjoy watching. And that's still something that I may come back to, but after, going through the courses at Full Sail and kind of learning exactly like what all goes into going out to LA and being in the film world and stuff like that. It didn't seem like the type of thing that I wanted to get into right away. So, um, so 2019 I spent figuring out what I wanted to do by writing articles on my own website and blog. And then that kind of set up a portfolio for me to reach out to um, a couple websites, one being hidden remote um, through fan sided and that was a huge platform for me to kind of put my name out there, write about my favorite TV shows and movies, make a little bit of income and get recognized by people in the industry. So that was really cool. And that's still something I, I've kind of stepped a little bit away from the pop culture stuff to focus more on wrestling. But as, and I'll get into this probably later, I, I want to get back to covering entertainment, wrestling, maybe some sports and, all those good things that I have interest in. Yeah, that's one of the things that I think wrestling lends itself to. Again, the interest in wrestling is that it is the overlap of the kind of sports writing and the drama writing. And so, yeah, there's a, I think that's you got a good, a good range there from writing the very straight sports stuff, television drama, and then somewhere in the middle you got pro wrestling. You yeah. Know? So where did your interest in wrestling begin, Colby? So actually about a decade ago, 2011 was the year that I really got into it. 2010 was the year that kind of started to grab my interest. Um, My brother, my younger brother um, got into it first because of my grandfather watched it all the time. And then so we would go pick my brother up when Raw was over and I would catch bits and pieces of the drama and stuff like that. So this was, I was in middle school around that time. And I remember seeing the Nexus show up and beat the crap out of people every week. And I was like, man, those darn bad guys, I really want the good guys to beat them. And so when they had that big SummerSlam match and everything, that was really cool. Um, But, and then another moment that I remember that kind of was like, man, was when the Miz cashed in money in the bank on Randy Orton. And I was like, oh, bad guy. Like, he's such a jerk. And so then Randy Orton became one of my f- first favorites because he was done I wrong. Live, yeah, <laughs> he was done wrong. And then he's from St. Louis, and St. Louis is pretty much the closest wrestling city um, where I'm from in Illinois. So we ended up going to a Raw in March 2011 um, on the road to WrestleMania 27 as part of my brother's birthday. And that, from there on, pretty much got sucked in because then I watched WrestleMania 27 and started checking it out every week. And pretty much by the time uh, CM Punk beat John Cena at Money in the Bank, that's really when I was watching every show every week. Yeah, it only takes a few weeks, really, or or, or, <laughs> or one really good, high-impactful moment. And, and then you're like, 
this is going to happen again in a week for two or three <laughs> right. hours, like I'll tune in, you know, yeah. and that's how I've gotten people who don't know what wrestling is or just like kind of are aware of it and kind of hook them on at the right moment. And then they're like, you know, like, oh, did you see what happened last Monday? <laughs> you know, and so <laughs> that's great. That's great. So tell me a little bit about this book you put together, the little journal. It yeah. it, it looks really cool. You know, I got the the Kindle one, but uh, the uh, hard copy should be here by Tuesday. <laughs> uh, I'm looking forward to it. Uh, yeah, it looks like a, it looks like a cool little magazine. So tell me a little bit about the project. What was the inception of it, and how did it come to fruition and all that? So after my job with WWE ended, I was kind of exactly where I was. A year before that, when I graduated, was when you're okay. What's next? And of course, with COVID, we you know we didn't know how long things were going to be shut down, all these different things. And so I needed to start coming up with ideas that I could work from home or come up with projects to keep me occupied since we were spending so much time inside. And so one of my passions is women's wrestling, and I thought, well, you know, my professors at Full Sail taught us to write what we know. And I kept coming back to the the wrestling thing. I thought I could write, you know, a fiction book. Um, I love dramas, love comedy, so I could do that. But I was like, man, I really want to write something on wrestling. And I've I've written wrestling articles and features and different things like that. But I felt like I could put something more substantial together and try to make an income off of it while also writing about something that I was passionate about and spreading the word about it. So last spring or so yeah i believe it was may um it's kind of when i just started compiling a bunch of different ideas and notes on things that i could cover and i thought well women's wrestling i could do a year in review i was thinking about like pwi does their their top 500 and rankings and things like that and so i was like well maybe i'll you know toy with that idea see where it goes and then spent the summer taking more notes. And I was like, man, we're going to be in the pandemic like all year, but I'm just going to see where wrestling goes in the year 2020. And maybe that'll be like something historic anyway, with the year being different that way that fans will want a piece of history. So it was one of those things I kept coming back to stopping and starting based on different life things that happened in 2020. And so by the end of the year, I had walked away from a job, didn't know what I was going to do again, and thought, I started this book. I could really finish it and get it out in the first part of 2021. So it's pretty much when it ended up happening, spent December and January really going to the wall with it. Um, So hopefully this year (laughs) um, (laughs) that doesn't happen again because I am planning on doing another. Um, But that was intense, but it was fun because I watched WWE, AEW, and Impact in my free time anyway, and those were the main three companies I wanted to cover in the in the journals since they're pretty much the main televised. promotions here in America. Yeah, televised. And especially the ones that kept going even through the pandemic and everything. So that's kind of the origin story of that. No, I love it. And I think that it's cool in the intro by you and the forward by thunder rosa that you know that the pandemic is addressed like of course it is right right and you had good professors in that they told you write what you know again i'm a writing (laughs) professor myself and i'm like yeah Yeah. that's, that's rule number one right right um and and so if you're deep in wrestling like well why not write about wrestling and if you're deep in a pandemic, why not just address that the first couple <laughs> lines, right? And yeah. so th- that's one of the things I, I did like and I did admire. Very much places it in 2020. So, uh, yeah, I think that's cool. How did you go about seeking the submissions for the chapters in the in the journal or the, the essays, rather? Um, so I knew that I could do the writing all on my own. And it just being my own voice, but I didn't really want that, especially since it was about women's wrestling and I wanted to include women however way I could. And I've developed a connection with several women writers out there. And um, so 
when I I've done some writing for Bell to Bells, which is a women's wrestling focused website. And so the first thing I did was hit up Chris and Ashley to see how we could get her involved. And, and then uh, Molly Bell was doing features for Fightful and a couple other different websites. So I knew she was one that was very passionate about wrestling and women's wrestling. And I knew I needed her voice in there as well. And then uh, Granger Chapman, um, I wrote some with on Daily DDT. And he's also a fellow Full Sail alumni. So we had that connection going. And Very cool. um, since the book was kind of my trial run to see if I could even you know, get it out there on Amazon, I didn't get everyone that I wanted included, but I got some different voices besides my own out there. And so I'm quite proud of what we did. No, I think it's cool. I think it's actually a really good length, actually, rather than these. You know, there's a lot of, uh, not a lot of, there are some, <laughs> there's a few, uh, <laughs> massive books of like, yeah. you know, like wrestling essays or any kind of criticism and these kinds of things. And I like that yours is a little bit, eco- little bit more economical in that way. Uh, I, I actually think that came out really well. Yeah. The forward is by Thunder Rosa. That's great. La Mera Mera. Yeah. That's Fucking cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm a, I'm a big fan. A huge fan. Definitely. A huge yeah. fan. How'd you go about getting a, the forward by Thunder Rosa? That's that's very, very cool. And again, it's a very snappy and again, again, timely couple pages she submits. And how, how'd that come about? So I knew, especially with this being my first project, I, you know, I want to attach many names to it as many, as many as I could anyway. Sure. And I thought, I really would love to get a female wrestler to write, to do something with the book. I thought a four would be a great way to um, incorporate that. And so I had several in mind, kind of avoiding WWE because, I mean, with every company, you have to go mostly through their PR. But I had a list of names in mind who some had won championships, some had just done some really cool stuff in 2020. And after not hearing back from a couple places and people, Thunder Rosa crossed my mind because I knew she she was under contract with NWA and she's working for AEW, but she's not necessarily under contract with AEW. So I found her email. Yeah. Yeah. So I found her email on Twitter and I just shot my shot and said, hey, this is an opportunity. Would you love to do this? And she was on board right off the bat and um, super cool to work with. And she wrote a great foreword um, that really helped in the case of getting eyes on the, this product that, you know, hey, this person's putting us over. You should also check it out. <laughs> no, yeah, for sure, man. Uh, no, yeah, good move on your part. And again, really good contribution on hers. And again, great independent star. I am, again, big fan of her Mexican roots. And uh, even on her Twitter when she, she posted that you know, she became a citizen and all this stuff. Oh, this is fucking beautiful. Oh, yeah. This is so great. It's just some of the coolest shit I've seen. And hearing her cut promos that have Spanish dropped in, uh, this is <laughs> so great. Again, like one of one of our people. And so I, I think oh, yeah. it's really cool. And she's connected with some of the folks I know. Again, a couple degrees away there in central Texas uh, uh, and whatnot from the, the folks I know there. Uh, very cool. Uh, what do you think about her future, man? Again, Good pick on her, because again, <laughs> since that came out, since your book came out, again, Ring Post Journal number one, a 2020 Women's Wrestling Year in Review. Where do you think her future is going, man? I mean, the sky's the limit, and it's so cliche, but it really is. Um, I mean, you look at 2020 alone. I mean, 2020 is the year that I, I really try to expand my wrestling tastes and knowledge outside of just WWE and Impact, and AEW was finally on my radar, and so. Um, and NWA was kind of, you know, trying to get going at the end of 19, beginning of 20. And so I, she wasn't on my radar really before 2020, just because I had been focused on the major promotions. And so sure. when she won the NWA women's title, people were saying really good things about her and her work. And then even in the middle of the pandemic, she started um, Mission Pro Wrestling there in Texas. Exactly. And that just seemed like such a a good thing for wrestling women's wrestling specifically and then when she popped up in AEW and had that feud with Sheeta I was like this is 
perfect. This is top <laughs> like, notch. Yeah. How, so yeah. Good. How is this happening in a pandemic year of all times? <laughs> right. And so it just, she was definitely at the top of my list to be like, Hey, you should, I'd love to have you involved with this because 2020 was such a big year for her. So I can only imagine where she'll go now. I mean, I'm compiling my win loss records for 2021 right now. And she's kicking butt in AEW and she's been one of the main women carrying NWA power this year since they came back as well. So the future is very bright for her. No. Yeah. I love her. She's really great and very charismatic. I think she has a, a huge fan base behind her. And if she just gets the right platform, she'll just, you know, scoot on into another level. Uh, yeah. And, and, you know, I could see her being a version of a hyper charismatic Latino, Latina, like, like Eddie Guerrero was, you know? Yeah. Like I, I could definitely see that on a, on a big national international scale. Yeah, she's right on the cusp of that uh, in a couple of years, I think. What else you got going on, Colby, in terms of your writing, uh, other projects you got going on? Again, you got Ring Post Journal number one. Is there Ring Post Journal number two in the pipeline? <laughs> What's up with that, man? So Ring Post Journal is kind of the main project of this company that I'm forming, trying to form, have formed, is trying to take off, um, called Meteora for Media. And that was something that I keep coming back to, especially as I'm trying to navigate the full-time freelance life, trying to work for myself and specifically work on writing and stuff that I'm not quite sure exactly where I'm going to go with the company or the media or what exactly it's going to be, but I'm definitely focusing on these journals right now. So there will be a 2021 women's year in re- women's wrestling year in review. I finally just started on that in May after kind of getting the first one pumped out and doing some marketing on that. So it was funny that exactly a year after I started the first one, I'm back grinding, trying to catch up on the first few <laughs> months of 2021. And so much has happened already just within these five months across many promotions I do have some more ideas for different ones, even outside women's wrestling. Um, But I think because I of my strong interest in women's wrestling, that's kind of where mm, many of my projects may focus on. Um, So the 2021 review will come out at the beginning of 2022 um, is my goal, hopefully earlier than when I got it out this year. Right. And then I'm working on, I have an idea for one that I'm hoping to come out with this fall. I'm just not sure yet if I'll get it done in time. So I'm not really <laughs> spilling the beans on it just yet. <laughs> yeah, cool. um, but it is another women's wrestling focused book. Very cool, man. No, I think these are cool projects, man. I think the the women's wrestling year in review is good. And again, a lot of work, even just yearly. That's just a ton yeah. of work. And so... I think it's a cool project you put out. And yeah, and I look forward to more. So this is the Writers and Fighters podcast. Obviously, you are a writer and editor. (laughs) Right. But I always ask the writers, have you done any fighting? So have you ever trained in like combat sports or anything like that? Not professionally. I wrestled my brother on the trampoline when we were younger. So that's the closest thing (laughs) that I have to actually getting in a ring but I you know the thought crossed my mind in middle school especially as I started getting and really getting into wrestling I was like "Ooh, maybe I could do that but <laughs> I knew I didn't have the 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 it factor I guess I got into the bodybuilding or the that aspect of it but different ideas crossed my mind especially early high school I was like well maybe a referee or sure you know if I wanted to work on my acting skills I could be a manager or something like that or maybe even commentate but I quickly realized my gifts were behind the scenes either writing about it or and then working kind of production and live events um, with the company so no um, (laughs) I am not a fighter don't think I will be but I do think the world of writing and fighting will be my my life from here on out 
No, dude. I, uh, uh, yeah, I, I hear you, man. You and me both. Like, yeah, I'm not gonna get there in the ring in that, in that kind of way. But uh, <laughs> I'll write about it. I'll talk about it, and, and these kinds of things. But uh, that, that's where my, that's where my expertise lies. It's uh, not in the actual performance or the combat. So. Right. Colby, what kind of social media plugs you got for folks? You got a website, you, uh, you, you on Twitter and Instagram and these kinds of things. Where are you at? I'm on Twitter all the time um, at Colby Apple G8. And uh, Meteora for Media has a Twitter and Facebook. So that's at Meteora, the number four, and then Media. I'm trying to get those off the ground soon, hopefully. Um, I don't have a website yet, but that's definitely something that I'm looking into as I kind of try to grow this brand and figure out its identity and stuff like that. Um, so those are the main social channels you can find me on. Yeah, definitely. We'll direct people over to your Twitter and anything you come up with, we will see it there and share it far and wide. Right. All right. But hey, well, thanks for carving out some time and uh, talking about that Ring Post Journal number one. Very cool project. And uh, yeah, man, I wish you good luck in the future. And uh, we'll have to have you back when that Ring Post Journal number two comes out. Definitely. All right, buddy. Take care. Thanks. All right, y'all. Thanks for listening to that interview with Colby Applegate, freelance writer and the editor of Ring Post Journal number one a 2020 Women's Wrestling Year in review. The foreword is by Thunder Rosa La Mera Mera. You can get the book over on Amazon. You can get the digital version or you can get the paperback version. If you want to follow Colby, you can follow him on Twitter. He's active on Twitter. Colby Apple G8, the number 8. So Colby Apple G8 on Twitter. As far as the podcast, you guys know the drill. Make sure you are following us or subscribe to us on your favorite podcast app. We are all over social media. Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. Ridersandfighters.com has all the latest information, episode guide, and links. Share an episode with a friend. Happy Father's Day to the dads out there. Happy Pride to everybody. All right, y'all. Be good. Be safe. Take care of each other. And we'll talk next week. 